Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the horrifying murder of Sophie Serkey, a 20-year-old woman who was murdered in 1993, but her case was just recently solved by the help of familial DNA. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. Now, before I get into this long and very upsetting case, I first need to say a thank you to the sponsor of today's video, and that is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform where lifelong learners can go to learn skills that will benefit them for a lifetime. And me and Skillshare have been like buddies for the last year or so. We've been in a pretty committed relationship, and that's because Skillshare really does benefit this channel specifically. If you don't already know, I do everything here as far as the channel goes myself, writing, research, editing, everything is my, everything is mine. everything was done by myself, everything was learned by myself because I am a lifelong learner. And Skillshare has really, really helped me in that regard because they've helped me fine tune skills that I already had and also learn completely new skills that can help benefit me in this current chapter of my life because we really have to try to keep up with the ever changing way that people work in this new world. So if you're anything like me, you too will love Skillshare because it is an online learning community that offers thousands of classes to a community of members across 150 countries. And they offer these classes in a variety of subjects from things on social media success, success, productivity, and time management. And what I'm currently most invested in, which is classes on podcasting. There really are just so many different subjects that you can look into and learn about. Basically anything your heart desires, there is a class for you to learn about that subject. So I recently started taking a new class to help me kind of loosen up my body a little bit because if you know I film sitting on my floor and it's not great for me. So I started taking a new class called Yoga for Flexibility, 15 minutes times 15 days. And that's taught by a teacher named Abby Carver. And I have really enjoyed it because it teaches you, as the title implies, yoga for increasing one's flexibility. This is something that I've been wanting to focus on for a while now, actually like flexibility in general that is, because man, your girl is stiff. And you know, I'm in my 30s and I have this new baby boy that I wanna be able to run with and to play with and to bend with and to pick up and to toss in the air. And um, I need a little flexibility to be able to do that. And the time is nigh because he is getting so big. And this is something that I've wanted to do for a while. And more importantly, I've needed to do for a while. And that's just one of the reasons why I find Skillshare to be so beneficial for my life. Because again, they have a multitude of classes across any subject that your heart desires. And what's most important to me, and I think would be would resonate with many people is you can do it on your own time. You can do it at your own pace. The classes are there whenever you want to access them. So you don't have to like show up at a certain time and learn at somebody else's pace. You can set it for yourself. And as somebody with not a lot of time, that is crucial, but learning is still something I want to do because I want to fill my own cup. So I'm not just out there always filling somebody else's. Do you know what I mean? I think you know what I mean. So great news. Skillshare is offering the first thousand members of the Brat Pack to click the link at the top of my description box, the opportunity to peruse all the classes that Skillshare has to offer for free for one month. So if you're like me and you want to join a community of rad lifelong learners and learn some skills that will benefit you for a lifetime, you can click the link at the top of my description box to peruse all the classes that Skillshare has to offer for one month free for the first thousand members today. Now I want to say another thank you to Skillshare for always, you know, working with me. It's been months now. It's been, it's been quite a few months. It's been about a year of us working together. And of course I want to thank you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. All right. Now that I'm done spreading the good word of Skillshare, we can go ahead and get into this video. Now this video is on a case that was actually suggested to me by a member of the Brat Pack. And this was a member named Sarah May. Hi, Sarah May. Thank you, Sarah May. And Sophie's case is actually a hometown suggestion. So Sophie was from the small town in Alaska where Sarah May is from. So she has a bit of a close connection with this case. This is a very tragic case. Sophie was a native woman from Alaska and she was literally just on a weekend trip when she was murdered. Like it was so, so wrong place, wrong time. And what makes this even more like unbelievable to me is Sophie was murdered in an incredibly brutal way, an incredibly noisy way. And she was killed in a very public place, a place where she would have been within earshot of many people. She was killed in a college dorm where other students lived. 
it's absolutely crazy to me because even though she was that close in proximity to so many people, nobody saw anything. Like nothing that could help solve the case for 30 years. For 30 years, this case went unsolved and nobody was arrested. But finally, somebody has been. So today I'm going to tell you the entire story. I read all the things so you do not have to. And at the end of the video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your head while we go through all the details. But the question of the day is this. What do you believe was the motive for the murder of Sophie? And just because I'm kind of curious, I just want to know your take. Like, what do you think about familial DNA being used to solve crimes? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the horrifying murder of 20-year-old Sophie Serki. Now, where do we even begin with this case? Let's start with jumping in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head to 1993 in Fairbanks, Alaska. Specifically, we're going to be headed to the University of Alaska and we're going to be going to Bartlett Hall. Bartlett Hall was a massive eight-story building, a dormitory for students, and the building was co-ed, but the floors were separated. Some floors were for the boys and some floors were for the girls. It was the morning of April 26, 1993, and it was just before 9 a.m. when a student named Shirley was coming back to her dorm room. And when she got there, she saw a note on her door. And this was weird to her because the note that was on her door was actually a note that she had written. She had written a note for her friend Sophie, who was staying with her, to let her know, like, hey, I'm going to my boyfriend's house. You can stay here. The room is yours. But the note was still on the door, and it seemed to be completely untouched. As she entered the room, she found that the bed was still made, the lights were still on, the TV was still on, all of Sophie's stuff was there, but Sophie was nowhere to be found. And it was weird because it looked like Sophie hadn't been there at all. The room looked unused. It didn't look like she like remade the bed. It looked like she had just never been there to begin with. And this made no sense because Sophie was visiting from hours away. She literally lived on the other side of Alaska. So it was unlikely, it was like wildly unlikely, she would have stayed anywhere else. Shirley was immediately worried. So she went and she called Sophie's orthodontist because you see the reason Sophie was even there is because she had like an emergency appointment that she needed to go. She flew all the way here specifically for this appointment. But when she called, they told her Sophie didn't show up for her appointment. So she's already panicked. She's already thinking that this is not good. And then she gets a knock on her door. And when she opens the door, she finds that it's the police and they're going door to door trying to get any information to see if anybody knew anything, had heard anything, had seen anything, because a girl had been found dead in the second floor bathroom. Shirley's floor. The bathroom on her floor. Shirley then tells police, like, my friend is missing. My friend, is, I can't even imagine what that felt like, but my friend is missing. And then she gives police Sophie's ID card that she had left in her room. And when police look at the ID card, they're able to visually determine that the girl in the ID is the same girl who had been violently murdered and then stuffed into a dorm room bathtub. And this girl was 20 year old Sophie Serki. Now, before we get into what happened here and the arrest, I first want to focus on what we know about who Sophie was. Sophie Sergi was a woman born in 1973 to a small village in Western Alaska called Pitkiss Point that was situated on the Yukon River. And when I say small, I mean small and remote. At the time, the population was less than 200 people and it was mostly indigenous people. Sophie herself was from the Yupik tribe, and she grew up with her mother, Elena, and her two brothers, Stephen and Alexi. And I didn't see what happened to Sophie, Sophie's father, but he wasn't mentioned in many of the art, any, actually any of the articles that I read. Sophie was a wonderful daughter and just a great person. She was bright, she was hardworking, and she was seen as a role model for the younger people in her village. She had gotten to go to college and she had gotten like a full scholarship to the University of Alaska, which was very far from where she lived. It was 500 miles away, literally on the other side of Alaska. And it was completely different. Like the life and the atmosphere was gonna be totally different from the 200 people town that she had grown up in. But she was super excited and super determined to go to college and make something of herself in her life. So she went off to college and she was studying marine biology, which is terrifying and beautiful because the ocean is so scary to me, but like scary beautiful. And she loved it and she did super duper well. She completed two years of schooling before deciding that she wanted to take a little bit of time off for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that she wanted to go home and take care of her mother as she was getting older. And the other was that she wanted to go home and get a job so that she could work to save up some money because she needed to get some dental work done. On her find a grave page, it said that she needed jaw surgery, which just sounds terrifying. But Sophie was a type of person who 
would work hard. She would work hard to save her own money for the things that she needed instead of burdening her family for her financial needs. So that's why she wanted to take time off school because she wanted to get this surgery done and she wanted to save her own money to do so. But anyways, she's off of school, she's back at home, she's working and she's planning to re-enroll in college in the fall of 1993. So she's working as a teacher's assistant at a school in her hometown village, her hometown village, her home village. And she would periodically go back to Fairbanks to have dental work done because that's where her orthodontist was. She would literally just fly in, stay a couple days, get the work done and fly home. And she had already done this three times prior to her murder, but it was on one of these trips to Fairbanks that she would be killed. It was a weekend at the end of April, 1993. And Sophie flew into Fairbanks so that she could have her dental appointment. And while she was there, she was gonna be staying with her friend Shirley. She wasn't enrolled at the time, so she didn't have her own dorm, obviously, but Shirley was enrolled at the University of Alaska and she was staying in the dorms of Bartlett Hall. And she was staying on the second floor, which was an all girls floor. Now it's said that the University of Alaska was not the safest school to attend. I don't know how it is now, but the narrative is that then it wasn't the best place to be. There was just like a general lack of supervision. I guess people were coming and going from the campus all the time, IDs weren't being checked, and you never really knew who was gonna be there and when. And this is where Sophie was staying with her friend when she was killed. And on top of that, the weekend that she was there was like right before finals. So people were letting loose, they were partying, they were drinking, they were packing their bags and they were getting ready to leave. Sophie herself was also planning to leave. She had been there two days and she was only planning on being there for that weekend. She had a refer, re return yeah return flight ticket for monday april 26 1993 and that was the same day as her orthodontics appointment so she was going to go do her appointment then hop on a plane and fly home april 25th the day before her murder was a totally normal day she went to a movie with friends she got some food again totally normal something we all do i mean i don't know if we all do it but something many people do her and her friends then went to a place where you could watch the sunset. And it was while there that the last photo of Sophie was taken. She's smiling, her arms are spread, sort of like she's gonna give you a hug. She just looks very happy and inviting. And then after that, Sophie went back to Shirley's place where she could like hang out and like have like a kickback. It wasn't like a party or anything. It was just Shirley, Sophie, and Shirley's boyfriend, Noah. I don't know why I put him in that order. That's a weird order. But they were just hanging out, watching movies, I think listening to music, eating pizza, totally normal. That's gonna be the theme of this. It's just a totally normal day that went totally just the worst way it could. So sometime after midnight, Sophie left Shirley's room and she went down to the common area to get a drink. She came back upstairs and after a little bit of time, she decided she wanted to go smoke a cigarette. But that would mean that she needed to go outside because they were on like the second floor. So she was gonna have to go down and brave the Alaskan cold, like it sounds freezing. I can't even understand the kind of cold that they probably experience in Alaska because I'm from Los Angeles. And you know, it's raining here now. You can probably hear it, the ambiance, but our cold weather is not cold weather like that. So I don't even have a point of reference for it. But Shirley was like, how about this? Because it's really cold outside. How about instead you just go into the bathroom on our floor, there's a vent in there, smoke in there, just be real discreet and everything should be fine. So Sophie goes out to smoke and while she's gone, her friend Shirley and Noah decide that they're gonna leave. They're gonna head back to Noah's room and leave Sophie to have the room to have the bed because she was the guest. Before they left, they wrote a note and put it on the door to let Sophie know what was going on. And then they left. And that's why when Sophie never came back to the room that night, nobody noticed her absence. It was the next day, April 26, 1993, that a janitor on the second floor of the dormitory was doing their duties, cleaning janitor, janitor stuff, yes. And they made their way into the bathroom on the second floor and started cleaning all the things. And then she, it was a female, I believe, made her way into the bathtub room. So I guess the way that the dormitory bathroom works is there was like the normal bathroom area, like showers and toilets and stuff. And then there was a separate room for the bathtub for somebody who wanted some privacy to take a bath. But it was hardly ever used because it was like a bathtub in a public place who wants to soak where like other people have soaked. It sounds kind of disgusting. So she goes in there to clean that area. And that's when she discovers Sophie's body in the bathtub. And she is very clearly deceased. This woman absolutely panics, books it from the bathroom, in hysterics and runs into a student who had just finished taking her finals and was headed back to her room to go to sleep because she had been up super late the night before. So they run into each other. The janitor, absolutely hysterical, can't even get her words out. So instead she takes the student into the bathroom with her to show her what she found. They both see it together again. They freak out. They run to get, I believe the student runs to get somebody in charge and the police are called. 
Once police arrive and they look at Sophie, they can see that she has gone through hell. Sophie had been bound and gagged. She was tased with like a stun gun. She had been beaten with a blunt object and had been choked, assaulted, and then stabbed multiple times, even to her face. Even her face was stabbed. She was stabbed in the cheek and her eye before being shot in the back of the head. She was still wearing her socks and shoes, but her pants and underwear had been pulled down below her knees and her sweater and her bra had been pushed up to expose her chest. And she was like wet, like her hair and her clothing was damp, which showed that somebody had turned the water on after putting her in the tub. Now this is happening. She's being found, but Sophie's family and her friend Shirley have no idea that this has even happened yet. So that morning things are kind of happening simultaneously. Sophie's family back in Pitkiss Point is getting a call from the, the orthodontist because Sophie didn't show up at her appointment and they can't really do anything from there. So they're learning that back home. And at the same time, Shirley is coming home. Now, Shirley actually came home twice. She came home at the time at 9 a.m., which I discussed in the beginning, and that's when she realized something was wrong. But she had actually came back earlier. And I don't know if it was in the middle of the night or just earlier in the morning, but when she came in, she thought that Sophie was like taking a long shower so she left and she says that at the time when she came into the room she didn't really notice anything unusual like it didn't click in her head that something had happened she remember being kind of annoyed at sophie that like the lights were on and the tv was on and stuff and that she wasn't using it but at the time she didn't like process that the bed was made and hadn't been slept in so this must have been in the morning now that i'm saying it out loud um she didn't process that so she just kind of left thinking that sophie was in the shower and then came back later so anyway she gets there the whole thing happens police come to her door they're able to identify Sophie tentatively, visually with her ID. And then Sophie's body is taken from the dormitory and she's taken to Anchorage, Alaska to have an autopsy performed. So the autopsy was performed. It was determined that she didn't have any drugs or like alcohol in her system. She was completely, you know, clean of all of that. But they did find inside of her DNA. But remember, this is 1993. And in 1993 in Alaska, DNA technology just was not really being used. Despite this, though, local police did what they could. They combed that bathroom, like, tile by tile, getting any evidence they could find. Yeah, they could find, even if they couldn't use it yet. They got fingerprints. They got hair samples. They got the DNA that was inside of her body, which I'm sure we can do one plus one and figure out what that was. And they just saved it and had it in her file in case there ever came a point where science would catch up with them and they could test it against something or well, against someone. After all was said and done, it was determined that Sophie had been killed between 1 and 5 a.m. And she had been assaulted before she was murdered and left in that bathtub. And she was actually last seen wearing a striped, like brightly colored striped sweater. And she was last seen smoking a cigarette down in the common area, which is an area where like a bunch of the dorms or a few of the dorms came together, which is interesting that she was last seen there instead of in the bathroom. I personally do question the eyewitness testimony that she was last seen there, like myself, just because it's pretty, it would be a humongous coincidence for her to be told to go to that bathroom to smoke and then her body be found in that bathroom, but that she didn't encounter someone in that bathroom. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It just seems, that's just my opinion. And we'll move on from there. Now, people were shocked by this murder to say the least. I mean, Sophie wasn't enrolled at the campus at the time, but she had been before and she had made an impact on those who knew her during that time. And on top of that, a girl being violently murdered in a dorm room with all of those people was just like hard for people to believe. You know what I mean? Hard for people to understand and comprehend. The chancellor of the college um, also wanted to honor Sophie and had the flags flown at half mass, half mass, half staff halfway down the pole. And they set up counseling for students who needed it. And they also set up a hotline so that students or parents who were scared could call and have somebody to talk to. Now for Sophie, more than 300 people gathered together for a memorial for her where she was celebrated. Roses, daisies, and snapdragons surrounded a picture of Sophie. And the service started with six native drummers chanting like in this overwhelmingly sad, sad chant. And there was also a native prayer circle held for her. Shirley, the friend that Sophie had been staying with, spoke at this memorial both for herself and also for Sophie's family who couldn't be there at the time. She said for herself, and I quote, it's important to know how much Sophie enjoyed life. Don't be bitter. We should continue to pray for the person who took Sophie away from us. Sophie ended up being 
her body ended up being brought back home for burial and she was buried next to her grandmother in the cemetery in Pitkiss Point. And her poor mother, man, was gutted. She said that for her, she had trouble processing that Sophie was gone. And in her mind, Sophie was just away for a while and would be coming home soon, which is just like so gut-wrenching to consider. Like to think about feeling that way and it's just really sad, you know, like her mom had just spoken to Sophie the day before she was killed. I guess her and Sophie talked at about like 4 p.m. that day. And they were just talking about this like old kite that Sophie had bought for her brother. I guess it was like an old, like banged up, like not great kite. And she had told her little brother, like, I will buy you a nicer one. and I will replace it if you behave while I'm gone. And that's what they were talking about. And, you know, Sophie would never be able to come home and replace it. And it's just like the things that you remember and you cling on to, you know. That would just be hell for any parent. And Sophie was such a good person that this like hell extended onto so many different people. Even one of her teachers after she was killed came out and said, quote, she was so young and bright. She had her whole life ahead of her. She wanted nothing but good for everybody. This just isn't supposed to happen. Now, right away, police started to canvas the area to speak to students and try to get as much information as they could. This must have been a very intense time because this was the first murder in this area since 1972. So they really had their work cut out for them and they knew they needed to solve this murder as quick as possible, especially because it was at a college and you needed to make sure that people weren't like panicking in the school, you know. But it proved to be difficult immediately because this was finals week people were leaving. Like as soon as finals were done, people were leaving before getting a chance to be questioned by police. And some people left and never returned, which happens all the time when people finish like a semester of college, like that's totally normal. So they were like trying to track all these people down. And some people were just leaving even before finals, like right after the murders, because they didn't feel safe being in the dorms. And then some people were like, I'm staying here. Absolutely. Because this is the safest place I can be. It's flooded with cops. Now you would think it would be easy to like look at a roster of students and tell who was in, who was at least staying in the building that Sophie was killed in, right? And like who was in each room. And this, you know, is true. They did have the roster. The problem was, is kids will be kids and students do be studenting. And a lot of people were staying in rooms that weren't theirs. They were just switching on who they wanted to hang out with, who they wanted to be with. So it was very difficult to track everybody down. But they were able to question who they were able to question. They did actually speak to two girls not four, two, who were able to provide some insight and who might have seen slash, well, heard something the night Sophie was killed. One of the girls that I'm talking about, her name was Vanessa, and she was actually in the second floor bathroom the night of the murder. She says that she went in and she remembers noticing that under the door, like to the bathtub room, that the light was on. And she thought this was weird because nobody used that room, but she kind of brushed off the uneasy feeling and she got into the shower because that's what she was there for. She was up staying up late to, you know, cram for finals and she wanted to take a shower to try to, you know, wake up. So she gets in the shower and she says she starts hearing weird noises. She said she heard what sounded like rustling and firecrackers coming from the bathtub room. Now, the next person who was a witness in this case was a girl named Jennifer. And ironically, Jennifer was actually one of the first people to see Sophie's body. Because you remember, the janitor went in, found the body, panicked, ran out, and ran into a female student who she then took into the bathroom. This was Jennifer, and Jennifer was also a witness. So Jennifer, like the girl before, was up late studying and decided to take a shower. Apparently, because of finals, everybody was doing this. This was pretty normal procedure. She said that she too was really tired and trying to wake herself up. So she went into the bathroom. Now she didn't go into the same bathroom as Sophie. It was on the same floor, but it was like opposite and they shared a wall. I imagine like a square and the bathroom's right here. I don't know. They share a wall, two separate bathrooms. So she goes in, she's taking her shower and she starts hearing noises through the wall. And she says that she can't really tell who it is, but she hears two voices. She says of this and hearing this, and I quote, I assumed it was a male and a female just because of the time of evening and, you know, sneaking into that little room. So basically she kind of thought it was two people hooking up, but then she said that as she listened, she heard a loud thud, which sounded like something heavy being hit into metal. And she says that she did think it sounded weird. It did stick out to her and she considered going over and seeing what was going on. It felt off with her and she thought it was possible somebody got hurt, but ultimately she decided to mind her own business. She finished her shower and she just went back to bed and didn't say anything, but it always did bother her that she didn't go and look at what had happened because she wonders what could have been. Now the police never fully shut down the dorms, like never put them on lockdown, but they did end up clearing the dorms out with students leaving to stay at apartments or like with friends nearby, whatever they had to do. And obviously this would be like a big convenience 
inconvenience to some people. It's not barely an inconvenience. It is an inconvenience, but it was also right before finals week. So most of these people, if not all these people were going to be leaving like right after this, they just kind of had to push up their plants a little bit. Now, I'm not sure if people chose to leave or if they had to leave, but they were pretty upset about it. They were upset and said, and said, and said that like they paid too much money to have such crappy security, which I get that. I guess the security was like super lax. Men were found in the women's bathroom all the time. There were people coming and going that weren't supposed to be there. There were issues with attempted assault, with successful assaults. Like it was not tight. Okay. Yeah. Now, I guess a few months after Sophie's murder, a lot of steps were taken to try to make the campus safer. They spent thousands and thousands of dollars on new phones that were installed in every dorm room, security was tightened, outdoor lighting was added, and new people were hired to check IDs of those coming and going from the campus. But it does always seem like something horrible has to happen for people to start taking steps to protect those they're meant to protect, doesn't it? Now, right off the bat, police did not have a suspect in mind when it came to Sophie's murder. They figured that it was probably somebody who was familiar with the campus and somebody who would not stand out being there, but they didn't know who it would be specifically. They just knew that this was definitely a hateful, angry person who killed Sophie because she was a woman and just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. They noted though that this killer was prepared. He was prepared enough to have a stun gun, a knife, and a gun on him. And they believed that this was somebody who had probably fantasized about doing something like this for a while and finally just found his opportunity to do so. And they believed that this was a person who used women to express their anger. Now, what was really scary for the locals is police came out and they were like, listen, we cannot confirm this is an isolated incident. We can't even confirm that this is isolated to the campus. So you need to stay vigilant. And that was scary because though Fairbanks was a lot bigger than like where Sophie had grown up, they still only had about 30,000 people at that time. So the fact that it could be somebody from the town, somebody local just walking around out there with the potential to hurt somebody else, somebody who could just walk by on the street, that was terrifying to people. Now, there were many issues with this case. And the most glaring issue of all was just timing. That this murder happened in a time where the technology needed to solve it just didn't exist yet because the police did what they could. They were thorough. They had the DNA. They just had nothing to test it against and they didn't have the science available to test it. You know what I mean? So they kept it, but the case went cold and it stayed cold for years. It would take 25 years before somebody was arrested for Sophie's murder. The spokesperson for the Alaska State Trooper said of Sophie's murder, and I quote, it's been one of the largest mysteries. This is a true whodunit. Now, even though all that time went by, that's not to say that anybody stopped trying to figure out what happened or forgot Sophie. There were plenty of people who were still out there fighting for answers. Protests were held and memorial services were held on the anniversary of her death where people would march to raise awareness and her mother would throw white carnations into the river in memory of her daughter, but nothing came of it. Police often asked people to come forward with tips. Anyone who might've been at the college or in the dark, Dorms, dorms, specifically to come forward. This was one of those cases where even Crime Stoppers put up a twenty thousand dollar reward for information, leading to the arrest of her murderer. Now, police did have a few suspects that they were considering, or a few people of interest that they were looking into, but none of them really panned out. There were a few that were brought up at the person who was eventually arrested, like brought up as their in the defense. Cool, good sentence. Um, but it didn't really pan out there either, spoiler alert. And I'm just gonna get into like maybe one or two of them because there were like several. But one that was like the most notable, one that really stuck out to police and stuck out to me as well, was a man named Kenneth. And this guy stuck out particularly because years after Sophie was murdered, Kenneth's sister went to police and was like, hey, my brother confessed to me that he killed Sophie. Now, when his sister came forward, this was not the first time they had heard of him because he had initially got on police's radar because they had seen him or they hadn't seen him. It was reported that he was seen outside of the bathroom on the night of Sophie's murder. So he was already somebody they were like, hmm, we've heard that name. Interesting. So they look into him. And when they look into his, you know, activities over the years after the murders, they were like, huh, this is somebody we might want to look into because he had a history of violence and had a history of violence against women. He was spoken to and he denied it, of course. And he even gave his DNA saying he wanted to help any way he could. And when technology caught up and they tested his DNA against the DNA found inside Sophie, it was not a match. Now, police did end up revisiting him after his sister came and said that he didn't. They were like, hey, 
So why would your sister say that you did this if you didn't do this? Because that's a very um, weird thing to happen. And he was kind of taken aback and was like, I have no idea why she would say that. I don't understand at all why she would come to that conclusion. Because what happened is that she and I were watching TV and a program came on about unsolved cases in Alaska and Sophie's case was featured. And I just told her that I had been a suspect, not that I did it. So I don't know. That's weird to me. It's weird to me that she could have heard him so wrong that she would go as far as calling police and saying that her brother had confessed to committing a murder. Like that's just, the math ain't math in there. But by the time an arrest was made in this case, his sister, this woman, had actually died. So that door is closed forever. And I don't know. Th this guy, Kenneth, clearly had some issues because he has since been arrested for manslaughter um, because of some bar fight where he got in a fight and he like broke some guy's jaw and then hit some other guy so hard or some other person, I'm pretty sure it was a guy, so hard that they fell and hit their head and ended up dying a few days later. And then there was even a manhunt where I believe there were dogs involved and they ended up finding him in a shed hiding out. Like it was a whole thing. So clearly this guy's got some stuff going on. I will say a bar fight where somebody dies isn't quite the same as what happened to Sophie. Like there are different levels of violence, um, different MOs, if you will, but it is worth noting that he's not like a great guy. Now, another guy that came onto police's radar was a guy named Nick. And Nick was actually a security guard for the school. I think he, like he was a student, but he also did security for his dorm. And he was looked at by police, sure, for a few reasons, one of which was proximity, because I believe his dorm was in the same building. It was in Bartlett Hall, but he wasn't, you know, seen as really a suspect in the beginning. And then they ended up re-interviewing him a second time when police, you know, a cold case investigator was looking into everybody. And they found that he had actually lost his job as a security guard when it was found or reported that he had a gun in the dorm rooms and that was not allowed. So he was questioned about this and he was like, yeah, I stopped doing my job, but it wasn't because I had a gun. I didn't have a gun. My roommate had a gun, but I didn't have a gun. And they were like, okay, that sounds, I don't know if I believe you, right? But they did test his DNA again against the DNA in Sophie and it wasn't a match. So they had to move on. Police would get many leads in this case and they followed up on all of them, no matter how far it took them. They'd follow them through all of Alaska, even down to the lower 48 because people were moving all over the place after they finished college, right? But no matter how many times they looked into something, it came back with nothing. And as years went on, the case ended up being passed from hands to hands, lots of different officers before finally ending up in the hands of some cold case, cold case, cold case investigators. It really seemed like they had nothing to go on and just needed that like one lead to send them in the right direction. And that finally did happen when an arrest was made in 2019. And this arrest came after some familial DNA was tested in 2018 and they found a match, which was the exact same way that the Golden State Killer was caught, which is a case I did like one of the first cases I did, I should really redo that one because I'm sure it's not very good. All my original ones I want to redo because I feel like I'm so much better now. But that's how this person ended up being caught as well. Now, the man who ended up being arrested was the roommate of a man named Nick. You remember Nick, right? The guy who was a security guard in Bartlett Hall, the guy who got fired because of having a gun, but was like, oh no, I didn't have a gun. My roommate had a gun. It was his roommate who ended up being arrested for Sophie's murder. This was a man named Stephen Harris Downs. Stephen had been friends with and was a roommate with Nick, as I said, and they were living together in the same dorm when Sophie was killed. At the time, Stephen was an 18 year old freshman student at the University of Alaska, and as far as anyone knew, had no connection to Sophie at all. Now, there isn't a ton of information on Stephen because at the time that the murder happened, he was relatively young, and since then, his life has been pretty uneventful. What I can tell you is that he was one of two kids. It was him and his sister, and they were both raised by his parents in Maine, where he went to and graduated from Edward Little High School. And then right after high school at the age of 18, he went off to college at the University of Alaska, literally as far away as he could possibly get without leaving the continental US. It makes sense why he wouldn't really be on police's radar all those years later, since he literally left college, like when he was done with school, he went back to Maine, which is as far as you can possibly get from Alaska. Now in his adult life, he did move around a little bit before ending back up in Maine, but then he did end up back up, end up back in Maine and had lived in the same area pretty much his entire life. In his adult life, he went on to become a registered nurse and had no record at all. And that's why when the DNA that was found in Sophie was tested against, you know, like all in the DNA database, nothing came up because he had never been arrested for anything. Now, speaking of him being a nurse, he ended up being fired from his job as a nurse in 2016 for like being 
like a crappy employee for one, but also because he got several complaints against him from other coworkers and they were usually female coworkers. One woman said that he had said things that made her uncomfortable while another woman said that he said and did things that made her uncomfortable. And the specifics aren't there on that though. I'm very curious as to like what exactly he did. And if it was like, you know, creepy guy stuff or just like, you know what I mean? Like we have no, there's no context here except for that he's a guy and they're women and that he's, you know, been arrested for something sexually violent to go on. So it's really hard to say. The records do show that he was reprimanded and then eventually he was just like, oh. now, even though Steven was never a suspect in Sophie's murder, his name had come up here and there because like he lived in the building. Um, he was known to carry like a gun and be into knives. And also his roommate was, you know, a person of interest. So his name did come up here and there. And he was even interviewed at one point, but it wasn't notable and they didn't suspect him at all. So now it's 2019 and Stephen Downs, who is in his forties at this point, is arrested on Valentine's day at a local business. I guess like a tactical key, tactical team came in, swarmed him, got him, arrested him, and he was charged with the first degree murder and sexual assault of Sophie Serkey. And he was held on a million dollar bail. And his attorney did try to get it reduced, but that was unsuccessful. The director of the Alaskan State Trooper said of his arrest, and I quote, while an arrest doesn't bring Sophie back, we are relieved to provide this closure. The case has haunted and frustrated Sophie's family and friends, the investigators and beyond. However, we did it. Investigators never gave up on Sophie. Moving forward, AST will continue to work our cold cases until all feasible leads are exhausted. We hope that we can provide this same closure to other families that have long waited for justice. Now, how do we catch this guy? I say we, like I was involved. How did we solve this case? Well, it was solved through familial DNA. So you remember that DNA was taken from inside Sophie's body and it was held forever right? They did run it through CODIS and they got no matches because Steven's DNA was not in the system because he hadn't been arrested for anything. So it hung out there just, you know, chilling, not killing is what the DNA was doing. And eventually the case got passed on to a cold case investigator who was like, okay, we've run the DNA through CODIS. Nothing is coming up. Maybe we should run it and see if anybody who is related to the killer has submitted their DNA to one of those genealogy websites like 23andMe. This happened in 2018, by the way, I forgot to mention. So the year before he was arrested. Now, the DNA profiles that were taken back in 1993 were sent to Parabon Nano Labs, which is in Virginia, and it's a genetic genealogy testing lab. And when it was tested, they found five matches and a few of them were actually second cousins or closer to the killer, which is like crazy. They were then able to narrow it down even further and got themselves down to Stephen's aunt who lived in Vermont. And from her, they were able to narrow it down to only one male relative that it could be. And when they looked at this male relative, they were like, holy shit, this is somebody who is literally living in the dorms when Sophie was killed. Nothing but <laughs> at this point, police know it's Stephen, but they don't know it's Stephen. You know, you can know and then you can, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. So they're like, okay, we need to get his DNA to actually test his DNA directly. So they put him under surveillance and they follow him for days, hoping he'll discard like a tissue or a cup, same with Goldson State Killer. And it doesn't happen and they get tired of waiting. So they're like, you know what? Let's go to his front door and question him. Let's scare him a little bit. So he was questioned a few days before he was arrested. I cannot imagine how scared he must have been, but apparently he didn't show it at all. Like police came to his door and he was friendly. He was surprised that they came all the way from Alaska just to question him. But I guess he was super nice and he invited them in and was like, come and sit in my living room. Let's have a conversation. When asked about Sophie, he said that he remembered a girl had been murdered on campus when he was there and he had seen photos of her, but that he, you know, didn't know the quote, poor girl. He said that he had nothing to do with it. And if he had known anything about who did it, he would have came forward like right from the jump because him and his friend Nick were furious when they heard what happened. And they were the type of men who were always defending women. From there, police are like, okay, here's the thing. We have very strong reason to believe that you're the one who did this to her. And he responded saying, quote, Wow, that's kind of intense. He then agreed to drive himself down to the police station to take fingerprints and get a DNA sample, which was really just a formality. They were like, would you mind doing that? Because they had a warrant to get it anyway, but he agreed and he drove in his own car and they followed behind in their car and he got to the station and they took a cheek swap. Once at the station, they told him, listen, we have a DNA sample and this DNA sample was taken from a very intimate part of Sophie's body and it's been run and it's been tested and it's your DNA, Steve, it's you. And we know it. And he was like, there is no way that's possible. 
they tried to get him to admit to the murder. They tried to get him to admit to the assault. And he was like, he just denied it flat out. And he was like, listen, I've never hurt anyone in my life. I got a job as a nurse because I want to help people. From there, the officer was like, yeah, you are a good person. You've done good things. You've lived basically a good life. But Sophie, Sophie deserves the truth. Sophie's family deserves the truth. You can now unburden yourself. You just need to tell us what happened. And he was like, listen, you do what you got to do. But this was not now, he did give one theory for who he thought it could be, and this was that soldiers from Fort Wainwright nearby, Fort Wainwright, um, were responsible for Sophie's murder because they were often partying in the dorms and passing through, but I never saw how thoroughly this theory was looked into. And it, does it, I mean, his DNA was there, so it's kind of like, ugh. From there, he was arrested and a search warrant was issued for his home in Auburn, Maine, and several items were taken as evidence, namely a couple of 22 caliber guns. Stephen pled not guilty to all of his charges, and his attorney even tried to get the charges dropped, like thrown out of court, saying of his client, quote, He was a healthy, good-looking, popular, intelligent, Dean's List student from a solid family in Maine, end quote, and was like, listen, the evidence is circumstantial, but this was unsuccessful. His attorney also filed several motions to exclude all DNA evidence um, and evidence that Steve owned weapons and evidence or testimony about when the DNA came into contact with Sophie. But all of those were unsuccessful because I think he was trying to say like that the DNA was there. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. After Stephen was arrested, it took a while for the trial to actually take place. There were several delays due to COVID because this was, you know, at right around that time. But finally, at the beginning of 2022, the case was set to go to trial and Stephen was extradited back to Alaska to face trial. Now the, the trial, how many times am I going to say trial? A few more times. The trial was closed to the public, but it was broadcast online. Stephen did not testify at trial on his own behalf, but several people did. People said good things about him and bad things about him. People who knew him then and who knew him now. And nobody really remembered him as being a violent guy at all. They said he was just kind of fun. He liked to party. But they did remember that he had a gun and a large hunting knife that he kept on him at all times. Now, as far as the gun goes, there were differing accounts on whether or not he had one in college. There were some people that said yes, and there were some people that said no. Like his college girlfriend testified at his trial, um, and her testimony matters a great deal, so we will get more into that later, but she, her name was Catherine, she talked about the gun. She said that Stephen was definitely into guns, and he had taken her shar sharding? Oh my god. Target shooting in the woods near campus before, but she couldn't say for sure that he owned the gun or if he had borrowed the gun. And then there was his friend Nick who testified. Nick did say that, yes, he did have a gun. But he also said that there was no way that he could see in his mind that Steve committed this murder. He said that he was a kind guy, a gracious guy, a friendly guy, somebody who just had fun and had a girlfriend at the time who he was with the entire night anyway. I feel like Nick must have had a hard time testifying at this trial because I guess him and Steve were like super duper close. Steve was even a groomsman at Nick's wedding. They were like buddies. They hung out together. They went camping together. They went fishing together. They lived together. Like they were really close. And now speaking of that, speaking of how close they were and speaking of Nick, this is just something that to me stuck out in my mind. Okay. You remember that Nick was a security guard in the dorms. Well, Nick was a security guard the night that Sophie was murdered. And I just find it to be a really big coincidence that the night that Sophie was murdered in the dorm bathroom, the night that he was a security guard in the dorms is the same night that she would be murdered and that she just happened to be murdered by his roommate. That's all I'm going to say. I just found that to be like an interesting thing that I didn't see really explored much in the articles that I read. Like, okay, he was on the scene the next morning too. Like he had worked overnight as a security guard. Her body was found in the morning. And then he stayed on as a security guard and helped like the police and the Alaskan state troopers keep people away from the scene and keep people out of the stairwell. Oh, and speaking of the stairwell, you remember Shirley, Sophie's friend that she was staying with. Well, Shirley says that on the night of the murders, when she was, you know, leaving with Noah, she ran into a guy in the stairwell. Like she passed by a guy. At the time, she didn't know who he was. But after Stephen was arrested and she was shown a picture of him when she when he was young, she was like, that's the guy that I passed in the stairwell. And she said that he had been on her floor. She said she was sure it was him. And he claimed he had never been on that floor. Now, what happened that night? What he says happened that night is Stephen who lived on the third floor with Nick was actually on the fourth floor the night of the murder. And he was with his girl, Kat, his girl, his girlfriend, Catherine. She lived on the fourth floor. And I guess it wasn't weird for him 
to, to be there. He would stay there all the time. The only thing that was unique about this night for him is that Catherine was actually having a party in her, her room. I guess it was like a smaller party, but there were friends filtering in and out. Everyone was hanging out, drinking, watching movies, eating pizza, having fun together. And he was there hanging out with his girlfriend. It's pretty similar to what Sophie was doing that night now that I think about it. But anyways, this, this accounting is actually coming from Catherine. Catherine says that it was a pretty fluid night and people were filtering in and out. And of the people that were filtering in and out was Stephen. I believe Nick too, Stephen and Nick were filtering in and out of her, her room. So even though Stephen would say that he never left the room that night, she knew that that wasn't true. She knew that he had left and came back, left and came back because something had happened that night that was notable to her. During her party, some other dude had tr had like come on to her and tried to kiss her. And she was like, yo, you are really lucky that my boyfriend's not here right now and didn't see that because, you know, he's been here and he's just not here at this moment. So I tend to believe her because that's a pretty like memorable, specific thing. She did say, though, that there was nothing about Stephen that would make her think he was capable of this. He didn't have any violent tendencies towards her. He never did anything that would make her think he was even capable of doing something like that. And she even went on to date him for several years after Sophie's murder. Now, Stephen's defense was working on a few different angles, and one of which was that Stephen didn't own a 22 caliber gun at the time that Sophie was murdered. Because when his house was, you know, raided, they did receive a gun, but he was like, listen, I bought that way after she was murdered. And normally this would be easy to tell, right? You could test the gun against the bullet and see if there was a match, but they could not do this in this case because the bullet that was recovered had been too damaged from when Sophie was shot. So they couldn't test it to see if it was the exact gun. They could see that it was the same caliber, but they couldn't say for sure if it was or was not the gun used in the murder. The defense also did their best to kind of put reasonable doubt in the jury's mind saying like, there's no way to say that the DNA found inside of Sophie didn't come from a consensual encounter. They were like, listen, this type of DNA can stay in a body for up to seven days. And this type of DNA can be transferred from things like washing machines, showers, and bathtubs, which is crazy. I don't know. Is that true? I don't know. Cause like where it was, I, I don't know. I don't know. Let me know. I, this is not my area of expertise. I am just telling you what I read. And I was like, wow, if that's real, that's crazy. But anyways, they also pointed out that there was no sign of physical trauma to show that she was assaulted and that this wasn't something that she wanted to do. And they were like, listen, you, you don't know what she did after she left that room that night, after she left Shirley's room. We don't know who she met up with. We don't know who she encountered. We don't know if she was up on the third floor at a party because we know that she knew people who knew Steven. So the attorney was kind of trying to imply that they might have ran into each other that night and done something consensual and then something happened to her. Even though Steven said that he had never met her, he said this during his confession and it was videotaped and it was played at trial. But the prosecution didn't believe this was possible and said that. They were like, there's no way that they just, you know, had a consensual encounter and then she was killed. The person who she had the encounter with is who killed her because the DNA was only found inside her. And then the prosecution said something, and I'm going to say the quote, and I'm gonna let you know it's a little crass right now. But the prosecution said of this quote, not in her underwear, not on her thighs, just in her V, because dead women don't stand up. And for what it's worth, those who know Sophie don't believe that it's possible she had an encounter with Stephen that was consensual either. Sophie may have smoked cigarettes and liked to hang out with her close group of friends, but she wasn't like a heavy partier and was just going through life, doing what she needed to do for her family. She wasn't out hooking up with random dudes when she said she would be right back. You know what I mean? Like she told her friends, I'll be right back. She wasn't going to go up to a party and meet some guy and like do what she needed to do. So they just don't believe this is possible. The defense tried to bring up several different people that could be suspects in this case. Like I said, there were a couple people brought up in the defense and they also tried to point out, well, they pointed out that saliva and pubic hairs that were found on Sophie's body did not match to Steven. And they also pointed out that none of his fingerprints were found in the bathroom at all. But the prosecution was like, listen, we tested and excluded 20 different people. 20 people were tested and the DNA was not a match. The DNA was only a match to you, Stephen. This was your DNA. And it was, it was DNA that wouldn't, would, had like a 0% chance of matching to anybody else. And it was found inside her. So the defense basically was just trying to bring the DNA and like its validity into question. That was like their whole point. They really did seem to be throwing whatever they could at the wall to see what stuck. Though some of it, when I was reading it, I was like, that is compelling, like the pubic hair and the saliva. I'm not going to say that that's not something that I'm like, huh, that's a little bit um, concerning. 
but the DNA. I go back and forth. This one gets me, man. I'm going to be honest. This one gets me. This one, I want to know what you think at the end because I'm just kind of like, I, I don't know. His attorney talked about how the crime scene was corrupted, how several people were in and out of the bathroom before the police and crime scene techs got there to do their work. And he also tried to argue that the chain of custody was broken. So how do we know that this DNA, DNA was even taken from that scene at that time? But then he'd like go back and forth first. He's like, maybe it wasn't even taken there at that time. And then he's like, well, actually it was taken there at that time, but it came from a consensual encounter. You know what I mean? That's what I mean by throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. At that, the jury was sent to deliberate. And after 20 hours of deliberation set over, you know, several days on February 10th, 2022, the jury of nine men and three women came back with their decision. They had found Stephen guilty of the first degree murder and first degree sexual assault of Sophie Serkey. And the, the decision was unanimous. It's really sad too, because Sophie's mom had been alive when Steve was arrested, but by the time he was convicted, she had already passed away. Her brothers were still alive though. And they, you know, were present at the trial, I believe over video though. They didn't, they weren't, I don't know why, but they didn't come in person. And Sophie's brother, Alexi said that he, you know, was happy with the outcome, that this was something that had weighed over his family for decades at this point and was happy to finally have somebody, you know, being held responsible for what happened to his sister. He also said that over the years, it was so hard on his mom. Oh, I want to cry. No, mm. but he said that his mom would just like burst into tears just out of nowhere, especially at like special occasions, things where Sophie should have been there. She would just start crying and then start praying to herself. It was just like incredibly hard for her losing her only daughter. And it's sad that she wasn't there to see, you know, justice finally be served for her. Now, all that was left was the sentencing. The prosecution wanted the hammer brought down. They wanted him to have like the most intense sentencing, the longest sentencing possible because of a couple of reasons. One, the brutality, everything that was done to her, it was so horrible, overkill, violent. It was so much. And on top of that, this person was very prepared, a gun, a knife, a stun gun. And she was killed while in the commission of a sexual assault. Like there was a lot, this is a, this is a horrible murder, but the defense wanted the judge to take a quote, more practical approach. His attorney was basically like, listen, he is 48 years old. He is over 400 pounds and he has high blood pressure. And then he added quote, I think that his life expectancy is not going to be, you know, 103 years old here. Anything in excess of a 20 year sentence, that's going to be bringing him near to the end of his life under the best of circumstances. And I read that and I was like, damn, don't hold that guy. Like, I was like, I would be so, if I was him, well, not that we care about his feelings, but like as a heavy set woman, I was like, damn, please, please hold back a little. His attorney also added that in the 30 years that had passed since the murder took place, he had been, you know, a productive member of society, had never gotten into any trouble, had become a nurse and had helped people. And then said that like, since being an inmate, since being in jail, he had gone on to continue helping people and had helped people get their GEDs and help people get into counseling for like substance abuse and depression. He then tried to make excuses for young Steven saying that he wasn't a monster. He was simply a boy who was four thousands of four thousands, four a, he was simply a boy who was away from home for the first time, 4,000 miles away in college, and that he was very immature. He was also very big into partying and would drink a fifth of whiskey a night and smoke a ton of weed, but managed to keep his grades up. We cannot forget that part. He then asked the judge to give his client a 50 year sentence with 30 years suspended so that Stephen would have the opportunity to hug his parents again one day. And the judge fired back at this saying, and I quote, since April of 1993, Miss Sergi hasn't been able to hug anyone. No one's been able to hug Miss Sergi. No one will ever hug her again. Ultimately, Stephen was given 75 years in prison for his crimes, 67 years for the murder, and an additional eight years for the sexual assault. Now, under Alaskan law, Stephen can be released early, eligible for parole after serving one third of his sentence if he like really is the model citizen that everybody says he is. So that would be 25 years. He was also given time served from the time he was arrested in Maine in 2019 to the time he was convicted. So with all of that said, he would be eligible for parole for the first time when he is 70 years old. The judge said of this, and I quote, I will note that there's no sentence this court could impose that there would be adequate restoration to Miss Sergi's surviving family or her extended support network. There's nothing this court could do to restore those folks. 
Now, despite police never really establishing a motive and Stephen never admitting why he did what he did, um, Sophie's brother does believe that they have the right person. He said that like the DNA won't lie to you. And that is true. I'm not going to lie to you. To look at Stephen, it's incredibly hard for me to picture him doing that. But, you know, it's been 30 years and things have changed. I just see him with like the button downs and the sweater vests and being like a larger man. It is hard for my brain, but her brother is right. The DNA is the DNA. And it wasn't found on her. It was found in her. It's just very wild that somebody, anybody could do this. And him at 18 years old, violently murdering this woman in a way, in the way that he did. And doing so in a public place, right? Where like anyone, just anyone could have came in, anyone could have found him, anyone could have seen this. It just, it's just absolutely insane to me. This, this case really got me. The day after Stephen was found guilty, a vigil was held in Sophie's honor. Members of the community stood outside the courthouse to remember Sophie as a person and the legacy that she left. There were songs and prayers and candles and posters that said that Sophie would never be forgotten. And people really felt hope having justice brought to Fairbanks and to the Native community specifically. Janelle Griffin Chapin, Chapin? Janelle, with the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center pointed out that many people who were there had followed Sophie's case their entire lives. And she had inspired in many people a flame for activism for Native people. And she said of Sophie's case being solved, and I quote, for there to be closure after so many years and justice for Sophie and her family is amazing. And it gives us hope that we can continue to find justice for our women and continue to build safety for our women across the state. Now, Stephen's attorney did try to get him another trial, which, you know, they always do try. They do, do, do be trying, you know, they do what they can, but the judge denied it. So at this point, Stephen is trying to appeal and his appeal was filed or at least announced that he was trying to appeal in October of 2022. But his attorneys, the attorneys that represented him at the murder trial did like file a motion to be relieved as counsel, citing that Stephen doesn't have the money to pay for them. So he's still appealing, but he's going to be doing so with a public defender. Like he's requested a public defender. Now, before her death, Sophie's mother did file a lawsuit against the university for $4 million, citing um, that they were negligent, that their security was negligent, that they let people just come and go on the campus however they please, how they didn't check IDs, and how essentially this could have been avoided if they had done so. I didn't see if it was successful. Um, I did see that the university was trying to settle with her, um, but she's passed. So I'm not really sure how that played out, but I'm glad that she went for it because she, she, she was entitled, in my opinion. Now, as for Sophie's family, her brother has come out and said that if he was face to face with Stephen, he would just tell him that he took something very precious from him, something very precious from him and his family. But despite that, he forgives him, but that he only gives him forgiveness that he will never forget. And with that statement, that my friends is the story of the murder of 20 year old Sophie Sergi. I hope you found it informative and it made sense. And I gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I want to thank you for remembering Sophie with me today. Now, considering everything I told you, I want to revisit the question of the day. And that is this, what do you believe was the motive for Sophie's murder? I have a lot of trouble just figuring it out for somebody to do something so violent and that to be the only thing they do. It's, it's just hard for me to wrap my brain around. And then, uh, of course, I also want to know, like, what do you think about familial DNA being used to capture murderers? I'm just kind of curious because I know it is controversial, but I want to know your take. And if you are, you know, of the mind that, like, you don't think it's good, I want to know why. I'd, like, I'd love to know. So let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. If you haven't already, before you leave, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below, along with a link to my membership where you can get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment replies, things like that. If you haven't already, please don't forget to leave me a suggestion down below of what comment you'd like to see, of what comment? <laughs> I'm tired of what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As this case indicates, if you leave me a suggestion, I will try to cover it. And if I do, I'll give you, I'll put your name next to the case suggestion on my list. So I can give you a shout out because I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. I want to say one last thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. It's sponsors like Skillshare that make it possible for me to put out content as consistently as I do. And I want to thank you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.